Hey everybody, Haku here with my review for Boku no Hero Academia Chapter 190, but uh, I call this a review, but maybe it's more a discussion, or maybe you could call it a little bit of both. I'm um, not really sure how to label or title what this video is going to be, uh, but I definitely wanted to talk more about this chapter. After doing the live reaction, I wasn't sure. I enjoyed it. It's one of my favorite chapters so far, to be honest, uh, but I wasn't sure about discussing it more, and then I just saw... Uh, other people in my comments and some of the discussion that they had that made me think even deeper on some of the themes in this. Uh, and then I won't talk about the drama surrounding it very much because I don't want to blow that out of proportion or anything. Uh, but I guess I should probably at least bring it up a little bit. Um, so I guess I will at least talk about that somewhat. Um, gosh, sorry. I don't know what it is lately. I cannot get my hair to like stay down. I just get random like bedhead just sections of it that stick straight out away from my head and it's bothering me so so much um, but yeah either way let's uh, talk about this chapter a bit I'm gonna talk about the chapter really quick first uh, and then maybe talk about the drama just for a quick second and then most of the discussion I feel like is just gonna be discussions on what I think this means and what it's uh, aiming for in the future uh, and some character things some discussions of high-end even the well not really for the future so much for high end because high end is 99.9% .9 probably dead uh, and really a lot of discussion about Dobby and Endeavor I would say uh, so quick just some points about the chapter to bring up so I can actually call this a review more than a discussion uh, it's one of my favorite chapters so far I love the first page where we have high end Endeavor and Hawks with them uh, with the sort of just one liners beneath them of their kind of I don't know, not really some defining things about them, but I guess they are defining things about all three of them. I really like the statements below each of them. Um, the regeneration of High End is able to keep up with Endeavor's flames as he hits that attack, so he gets Hawks to lift them up into the air where there's no need to worry about hitting any buildings or civilians or anything like that. Uh, Shoto cheers him on, which is something that I just wanted to see for the emotion's sake. I was going to cry during that live reaction. I was holding it back. Um, he hits him with the plus ultra prominence burn. It looks like a meteor and it's completely awesome. Uh, and then, does the hand crusher strike again? Because in addition to Endeavor just being pretty fucked up in general, he's been stabbed through the arm, he's been stabbed through the torso. Uh, his face is all cut up. He's probably, I don't know if he's lost the eye or not. It looks like probably, but he's going to have a scar like Shoto, which is cool. Uh, except much worse. Uh, it's very brutal looking, at least right now. That one panel where he was just throwing up all the blood, uh, I think last chapter, was um, really brutal. But his hand looks really just, his left arm is just charred and burnt to a crisp. So I'm wondering, did the hand crusher strike again? Is his arm going to be all messed up now too? Uh, and then one of my favorite panels is Shoto relieved and kneeling down afterward. So good. Uh, then at the end, Dobby arrives, which kind of confirms all theories that he's a Shotaro that <laughs> Shotaro that he's a Todoroki. Um, I feel like he has to be. And if Shoto's name matched the rest of them, then we could have probably guessed Dobby's name, but it doesn't, so I don't know. Because Natsuo, Natsu obviously summer. Fuyumi, Fuyu is winter. Um, Shoto isn't a season. If Shoto was like spring or fall, we could use whatever one was left to guess Dobby's real name. But uh, it's not the case. I'm pretty sure Shoto means like... Does Shoto mean fire ice or hot cold? It's one or the other. Sho is either hot or fire and To is... Because I've seen characters that have ice powers in other series called like Toka or Toya, things like that. Um... So Toe, I'm pretty sure, is either cold or ice. Um, so yeah, Shoto's name doesn't fit the whole summer-winter thing. Um, so yeah, that's it for talking about like the chapter, just the overview really quick. Uh, to talk about the drama, it's a little bit dumb. I'm pretty sure that a lot of you, if you've been keeping up with the series and watching videos on it and stuff, uh, from a lot of people that are probably larger channels than I, there's this drama going around that Horikoshi's getting death threats and getting insulted and attacked over um, being what's the way to term this an abuse apologist I don't I don't think that's true at all and I'm trying not to be insensitive but I think that's an extremely extremely dumb take 
Uh, but from what I've seen, I've only seen one person actually say that, and they weren't even, like, adding Horikoshi himself. Uh, they were just tweeting about it, and it's a really dumb take. Uh, but I understand the gist of what the what the perceived complaint is, and it's just really dumb in every way because the actual story contradicts everything that they would complain about in any way. Uh, but I'll, I'll talk more about why that's so. Uh, but I wanted to say, like, I've seen that once, but I've just seen person after person after person. Oh my god, it's so horrible. Horikoshi's getting uh, um, death threats and all this again and again and again. And uh, I did see, well, not really the death threats, but I did see more of this insulting or attacking or coming coming at Horikoshi with the drama about him drawing the girls in swimsuits. Um but not so much with this, and the reason I don't want to talk too much about the drama aspect of it is because sometimes the drama is more than the actual drama. Uh, because sometimes there will be something, and I've seen it so many times in the, I don't want to say anime community, because that's just so vast. There's so much there that it's not really one unified community. Um, but I've seen so much where the... If you see something dumb like this, like death threats over something so wrong, um, it's good to speak out against that. But a lot of times, I've seen hundreds or thousands of people saying, Oh, this is terrible. Oh, look at these people um, that are sending death threats and all that. And yeah, calling them out is cool, but it gets to the point where the drama is like really this small. It's like a couple people that are problems and that are probably going to complain no matter what. And then this vast group of backlash is creating and stirring up more drama than the actual small thing that was complaining at first. Um, which is why I guess I didn't want to talk more about this. And I think it's dumb to say that he's an abuse apolog apologist when their, their main thing is that Endeavor was abusive, so he's bad and irredeemable. But as I've seen people talk, like like I said, hundreds of people talked about the subject, and I've been reading a lot of people's thoughts on it on Twitter and in videos and stuff, and it seems like a lot of people, even that have been through abuse themselves that have been talking, um, don't see this as that at all. Because a lot of times in abuse, it's not like the person is just evil completely all the time. Um, sometimes it's like what they're doing is horrible and terrible. But sometimes they're horrible and terrible, but they are so beloved by the community that it kind of gets swept under the rug. And that's what makes this Endeavor stuff even more realistic. Or they're terrible in that aspect, but they're nice a lot of the times too, uh, which is common with abuse. And another thing that goes into it is like, um, say, if they were abusive and then they say, oh my gosh, I was wrong, I'm sorry, and they make up for it. And I saw a lot of people that have been through situations just like that saying it's one of those things where you can never really forgive them and you always have this slight bit of hatred for them for what they did to you, but you also see that they've changed and they're not the same person anymore and you love what they've done and you love them for what they've done for you since then and love them for how they are to you now. Um... So it's one of those things that's not that simple. Nothing is just black and white. And in some series, it is that way. There's often times where abuse is portrayed as just the person is terrible all the time and there's no, like, I don't know, there's no, I don't want to say there's no good because there is no good in abuse, but acting like abuse means the person is terrible to everyone all the time when that's not true. They're going to be nice to some people. Some people are going to not see the abuse or are going to excuse the abuse. Um, and that's what makes Boku no Hero Academia a lot more realistic with it, I think. Because looking at all the different characters' perspectives and what they went through, I've said before that I don't think Endeavor was er ever a terrible person. He just did terrible things and made excuses for it by saying ah, it's for the greater good. Uh, because if he were a terrible person, would he have solved the most crimes out of any hero ever? Uh, in the way that, I don't know, I'm trying to find the best way to think about all this. But the thing is, we know that 
the three things that the top hero is based on are the amount of crime solved, the popularity, and I, I believe the third one was the effect on society and culture. All Might was way better approval ratings for sure, and had definitely more of an effect on culture and society, whereas Endeavor had solved a lot more crimes. He had put in the hard work, where All Might also put in the hard work, but he knew that there was more to that than to be more than that to being a hero. He also wanted to be a symbol to inspire everybody else uh, to live in peace. So it's one of those things where Endeavor was really never a bad person, but he did bad things. And the way he did it, another thing I could argue is, and we're going to talk about Endeavor's road to redemption here, and this is not about the drama so much anymore, but more about the actual chapter. Um, but the two go hand in hand with how the idea of abuse apology is dumb because of what Endeavor's redemption story has been. And getting into that redemption story, if Endeavor were truly always a terrible person, then him finding out that All Might is in that weakened state or whatever, uh, a lot of people I saw bringing, I saw brought up before uh, when it was happening in the anime, they're like, oh, I bet if. I bet Endeavor, if seeing All Might Week, or before uh, the All for One stuff, they were like, I bet if Endeavor ever sees All Might in his weakened form, he'd take advantage of that and, like, betray him or something so that he could be number one. But it's like, Endeavor, if Endeavor was terrible, he could have done that. He could have just left All Might alone instead of trying to help at all. But he didn't. His first thoughts weren't, oh, All Might's weak, oh, I can be number one. Or he's weaker, so maybe I can be stronger than I thought and I can show him up and gain the attention. He never tried to do any of that. His first thoughts, even, were about his wife and son. The first thing he thought about when he saw that was, oh man, I, I fucked up. So, again, his first thoughts weren't to excuse himself or to say, oh, it wasn't that bad, or to say, well, at least I, what I thought I was doing was right. His first thoughts were, oh, no, I was totally wrong. Shit, I need, to, I need to make up for this somehow. And then moving on from there, we know that he's been trying to see his wife, and we don't know how long that's been going on. That could have even been before this he's been trying to uh, find some way to, I don't know if make up with her is the right term, but... Obviously, he's done all these things. He's willing to sacrifice himself to help people. He solved all these crimes. Obviously, he's good enough to feel terrible that she's been put in a mental institution. And we've seen evidence of that, even though she has not obviously had the courage to meet him face to face yet, because, again, abuse is a crappy thing. And I think the biggest part of it, um, the biggest part of her abuse, maybe more even than him being abusive towards her would be her burning Shoto and not being able to forgive herself so much and it being partially his fault. I think that's probably the biggest part of it itself. So he goes on from there and then his scene with Shoto is one of my favorite things ever where he says that, you know, I'm going to become a hero, a father you can be proud of. And to here and now, he makes that speech that I think is the best thing ever when asked what a hero should. And, of course, he isn't just being passive about it or saying, hey, let's talk this through or whatever. He's taking active steps to try to change. When he talked to Yo Arash and when he talked to the fan on the street, he was trying to change who he was for the better and trying to behave like he normally wouldn't have behaved. But in addition to that, it was, um, he took the active step of going and asking All Might what he should do, what it should, what the symbol of peace should be. Um, but that leads to his speech when asked what the symbol of peace should be, or what he's going to do as a number one hero, or what it means to him, or whatever, or what society should take from him. He doesn't give this long speech about what he thinks it means, or how hard he's worked for it, or how much he thinks he deserves it. He just says, just watch me, which is probably one of my favorite lines in the manga now. Like, if you want to see what a number one hero should be, I'm going to be that. Just watch me. I'll set an example. And it's so great because back in the summer camp arc, and I don't have notes for any of this, and I felt like I should do that for this video so I could just discuss things from the heart. But back in this summer camp video, that might be why it's hard to remember some things. Or not really remember, since it's just discussion, but whatever. Um, 
When Izuku and Shoto are talking about Koda, Shoto says, you know, words without action are meaningless. If you want to get through to somebody, you've got to show them what you mean. You have to have actions that show that your words mean something. And now we see Endeavor doing the same thing, like, I'm not going to just tell Shoto I'm going to be a good father. I'm not just going to tell him that I'm going to be someone he can be proud of or that I'm sorry. I'm going to show him that I'm sorry. I'm going to show him that I can be better. And I feel like he's trying to do that. And I think we can see this more and see more how the abuse apologist thing or that he's writing ab or that Horikoshi's writing abuse badly, how none of that makes any sense with how some of the other characters react to Endeavor. Uh, specifically his family. Even though Ray was abused by him, even though she hasn't been able to see him again, mostly because of herself not being ready and because her doctor uh, doesn't think she's ready either, but even then, when her kids are like, well, I can't just, I can't forgive him for what he's done, or he's just trying to run away from us and forget us, forget about his family, forget about his past, Ray actually defends him in a way, saying, He's not trying to run away. He definitely still is facing his past and what he's done. And she, it kind of like, the translation is difficult, but it kind of feels like she's saying, you know, with him bringing this flower, um, even though I only told him about it once when we first met and he's been doing this for a while now, it kind of makes her like seem like she's saying, you know, he is making up for it. He's taking those steps. Hey, I am super, super sorry about that really abrupt uh, break that will probably be had in this video if I'm recording it the way I plan to, or at least the way I plan to record this latter half. But when I was recording this video on Sunday, and I was planning to post it Sunday, my recording software crashed, and I spent all of the rest of Sunday and Monday trying to get it to work, and just Tuesday morning I've finally been able to fix it. So I'm going to record the rest of this Tuesday, but I didn't want to re-record that part because it was just me with pretty much no notes speaking from the heart. And I probably did a very horrible job with things, but it was natural. It was what I wanted to say. And I think I'm going to be able to save it up until I was talking about Ray's perspective. Now, I talked about the chapter, and I talked about Endeavor a lot, both in my past videos and in this one. And there's not much new to say about Endeavor. Uh, he's trying hard. He's not going to give up. Uh, and he's making that slow change. And we're talking a little bit about the drama, but it's more about the future of the series and how deep and good this is, where if it's not so black and white. If it were like people, like there are some people complaining about, if it were abuse apologism, I have no idea the proper uh, terminology to use there. If it were that, though, then it would be like Endeavor made a complete turnaround and everybody just forgave him. And it's been a very slow journey, and we see that that is not true. Nobody's really forgiven him yet. Um, or if it went the other way, he would just be terrible and abusive all the time, and there'd be no redeeming qualities ever. Uh, so it's not that black and white. He's trying to make that change, and he has to actively work for it. And it's not something that's coming easy, but it's something that's coming naturally. We see from the beginning that he realizes, oh crap, I was wrong when he gets that uh, impetus to realize it. So it's something that naturally he realizes he was wrong, and now he is going forth to try to make that right. And it's a long journey, and talking about all the different ways that his different family members think about him is important in that. And I talked a bit about Ray already, and the important thing with her is that she is like, I can see that he hasn't given up on his family. He's not, like, abandoning any of us. He's still fighting that past, but I personally am not ready for it yet. It's kind of where Ray is on this. So again, it's a journey where he abused her. She's not really ready to meet with him and, like, work things out yet. But she sees that he's putting in effort, that he's getting there. Um, and then moving on from Ray, I'll talk about Natsuo a little bit. Natsuo is like a situation of, even though he wasn't really horribly abusive to me, but I think just the absence is that way. It's more psychological, where he left Natsuo and the rest of them and just focused on Shoto, and even though he, I guess, kind of pretty much beat Shoto and Rei, 
And again, we don't know the depth, and that's something I didn't say for Ray. we don't know really the depth and nuance of that relationship very much yet. We've only seen a small bit, but from the brief flashes that we've had of their past together, I would be willing to bet that there's a lot more that we don't know about that that we're going to see in the future, either A, because of all this Dobby stuff that we're about to get, which I'm super excited for this week, or B, whenever he does, find, presuming he survives, <laughs> whenever he does finally get to see Ray again and they get to talk about their issues, and I really hope we do get to see that. That'd be amazing. Um, but with Natsu, what he's like, Okay, even though he wasn't horribly abusive to me like he was to you or Shoto, I still can't forgive him for what he's done. And we see it with what Fuyumi has told him and with what Rei has told him. Like, even if you understand something, you can't accept it. Even if you understand he's trying to change, you can't accept that he's trying to change. And again, Natsuo, I like how each different family member is showing a different way that people could deal with a situation like this. It makes it very, very deep and pretty realistic. Um, because Natsuo is dealing with it in a way of, he was abusive, I want nothing to do with him, I can't possibly forgive him, even though he's working for forgiveness. And Natsuo can see that, and I think eventually he probably will forgive him. Uh, because it's a shonen, and hopefully everything works out happily ever after. But he's at a point right now where he's like, even it, though it didn't direct, it wasn't directly against me, even though in my opinion it kind of affected him quite a lot, it would have, it would have affected all of them, uh, at the same time, it's like, I guess I kind of already said it and I'm going on and on, but he says he can't forgive him right now, but I think he's going to, even though Endeavor's making that change. And then, Fuyumi is one of the most interesting ones to me. I find it so, so interesting that even though all this has gone on, she's continued to live with him. We've seen up until recently, whenever Shoto's at home or Endeavor lives, she's there living there as well. And she's the one that, even though she's living with him, it's not like she's picking sides or anything, she still goes and visits Rei, she brings her new clothes and stuff, and she seems to have a good relationship with her. Um, and we don't know how long she was seeing her before Shoto, sorry, Hiccup, started doing it as well. So that's really cool. She tries to kind of shield her from um, Natsuo talking about Endeavor as well. And when she talks to Natsuo, she's the one that's telling him is like, she was telling him basically, you haven't been living around him to see the strides he's making and to see how he's trying to improve. And even if you understand it, uh, you can't accept that he's doing it. So she seems the one to me to most understand Endeavor out of all of them. That doesn't mean she likes him, or that she agrees with him, or that she forgives him for what he did, but she seems to be the one that has the deepest understanding of how much he's trying to change, maybe even more so than Shoto. Uh, and then, of course, Shoto is the most brilliant of them all, because we've seen it the most on screen, of course. Um, and we start out to a point where he hates him, and because of him hating his father, he's becoming more like his father, just the ice version. Uh, we see that with his past with Yoadash, that his hatred for Endeavor caused him to be more and more like Endeavor. Uh, and then, after a while, Endeavor re realizes what he did wrong, but even before that, when he fought Izuku, it's one of these great things that I think is super realistic too, though he was abused by Endeavor, he gets to this point where he smiles and he uses his power and he realizes it's his but it's not just some instant thing because he goes back after that and can't use it again where he tells Endeavor he's like it's not that I accepted it I just forgot about you and I don't know whether that's right or wrong and again it's super realistic because people in an abusive relationship or people that are abused it's not going to be constant all bad all the time occasionally you're going to have fun with something, whether it's going out with friends or reading a book or watching TV or whatever, you're going to have fun with something, and that doesn't mean that it just takes away everything that happened to you, but you forget about it just for a second. And that's where Shoto was, and then eventually he came to be like, okay, it is my power, he worked things out with his mom, and that sort of stabilized things for him in that regard. And later on, once Endeavor has realized what he did wrong, he comes to Shoto and says, I'm going to be a father and I'm going to be a hero that you're proud of. 
And one of my favorite things about this interaction, it's one of my favorite interactions is in the entire series, is because he comes up to him and he's telling him that, and Choto's just like, whatever, dad, I hate you, teen angst, and then, like, turns his back on him, and Endeavor walks away, and he, we have some stuff with Yo and Ash there, too, but other than that, he's, he snaps at him, and he's like, whatever, I don't forgive you, and Endeavor's walking off, but Shoto's trying his hardest not to smile when he leaves, and he's like cracking a smile but trying to hold it back, and just the subtlety and the emotions that uh, Horikoshi is presenting is so, so good. Um, but it's like one of those things where he's snapping at him, but deep inside he's he's happy because even though he hates him and even though it doesn't take away the abuse, it is something that he's happy for. He longs for having that relationship be healthy and right, even though the past is always still going to be there. And it's one of the most complex and nuanced things. And that's why it's very good. I mean, if it was abuse apology, uh, uh, being an abuse apologist, he would have just had Shoto like, I love you, Dad. And then Endeavor, I love you too, son. And then High End and Dobby look at each other and laugh. Um, but Things weren't like that. It's a lot more complicated. And even to this point now, where even though Shoto still hasn't totally forgiven him, he's taken what he said to heart, where he said, you know, actions speak louder than words, and Endeavor said, just watch me. He said he's going to be a hero that he can be proud of, and a father he can be proud of by extension. And now Shoto's watching him. Pretty much him cheering him on was saying, prove that, prove that you're a hero I can be proud of. And him sort of kneeling down, exasperated after the fact, like, oh my gosh, thank goodness he's okay. It's not saying that, oh, he totally forgives him, or that the past didn't happen. It's just that Shoto's a good person still. Shoto's going to care about what happens to him as a good person. Um, so that says a lot more about Shoto than Endeavor, I think. Uh, but that's basically it about talking about the Todoroki family, minus Dobby, probably. Uh, most likely, I would say it wouldn't make sense for him to not be a Todoroki at this point, for him to be Todoroki 3, the emo Todoroki. So I'm going to talk about High End for a quick second, and then I'm going to talk about Dobby. So uh, again, I have little bullet points of notes to help me um, with some, so I don't forget every topic that I wanted to talk about with them. Uh, but High End, even if High End dies here, I think that High End was a great villain and quickly became one of my favorite characters. Maybe I was anthropomorphizing High End too much, uh, putting too many human qualities on him. Um, but High End was a great character, really, really badass, probably my favorite villain so far. Um, even in my opinion, seemed a lot more badass than All for One, because All for One was just doing these big giant punch and destroy everything attacks, where High End had this awesome combination of quirks that was really, really great. Uh, one thing that I think this chapter showed us, and it was a comment from, uh, well, it was a comment from White Bear Beppo that made me think, because they said, um, they said something along the line, so I guess High End was really just a beast or whatever, but it got me thinking that this could be an example of showing us what the weakness of sentient gnomus are. It seems like the the directive or the, the thing that High End was told to do was go kill the strongest hero, go kill the number one hero, so we're seeing that the weakness is that he's maybe got... Like, maybe if you give something with a mind as fractured and tortured as an Omu an order like that, because they're sentient, and because it seems as though High End actually had real strategic thoughts and feelings, that because of that, they can get obsessed with whatever that order is. So if the order was to defeat the strongest, he was looking for somebody stronger than Endeavor, and if he found somebody and they were meaning for him to kill Endeavor, he might have just let Endeavor live and go off to try to kill whoever he thought was stronger. Or the fact that when Push was coming to shove and Endeavor kept powering up, eventually High End became beast-like because they became so obsessed with killing the strongest that they couldn't think about other things around them. So, again, that's, this might be our example of why a sentient Nomu has a weakness, is because it can think. Its greatest strength is also the weakness in that if you try to give it an order, 
and uh, treat it, I guess, like a monster slave, then it's going to um, become obsessed with that order you gave it. Uh, so, yeah, that might be the uh, the drawback to characters like High End, but gosh, I'm, I'm just so disappointed that High End is, in my opinion, 99% likely to be dead. Um, probably even more than 99%. Um, I'm disappointed because there are so many potentials with a sentient Nomu character. We could have those potentials explored in a different sentient Nomu, but I would have liked for it to have been High End. I would have liked for High End to be kind of a unique thing among Nomus, or at least a somewhat unique thing among Nomus. Uh, so yeah, one of my favorite villains. And there is, even though, like I said, I'm like 99.9% .9 sure that High End is dead, there is always the chance that High End could survive, because if all of this stuff was happening before, he was regenning even when being burned from the inside before, uh, his head isn't destroyed, even though we see his head is charred, uh, we have a close-up of his face as it's all burnt. There is a chance that they could somewhat, somehow regenerate or survive. It's very, very small, and like I said, probably not going to happen, but I want to bring up that it's there just to cover all my bases. Because Dobby was going around, we knew between the last arc, really, with Dobby and this one, Dobby was going around, and Snatch said... Uh, the Sand Hero way back at the uh, Overhaul arc, that there had been a lot of crimes that were tacked on to Dobby, and Dobby confirmed it was him, where people were being burned to a char. So we don't know quite why he was doing that yet, but one reason could be collecting quirks for high end, and if that's the case, maybe he found a quirk that could withstand his flames, and so he's like, okay, we'll give him that so he can survive against Endeavor. So there is always a chance, and that could uh, have something to do with Dobby, and leads me into my discussion about Dobby. One big thing is that we don't know what he was doing in that time period, why he, why he was killing all those people. Um, what was the point of it? What was he actually doing? Was there more to it than that? We know that it looked like he was going out like twice and trying to recruit new members and he was just burning to death the people that he didn't think were strong enough to join the League of Villains, but there definitely could have been a side project there because it seems like he's the one that's been in charge of this whole high-end situation and if that's the case he could have been the one out there collecting quirks and uh, maybe setting up this plan ahead of time. Um, and one thing that needs to be brought up is that he could kill Endeavor here, but I think he's not going to because there's a lot more story to be had with Endeavor alive than dead. He could totally kill Endeavor though because that would be huge for Shoto's character. If he kills Endeavor, then Shoto's going to be like, I was this close. I was so close to having my father come around the corner, make a change, be a good person, and having that relationship with him, and Dobby took that all away. Dobby took away the chance for my father's redemption that could have led to a healthy relationship for me. So that could be really deep for Shoto's character. But rather than kill him, one thing that most people are saying that I think is very likely is that he could discredit Endeavor by revealing everything he did in front of news cameras and stuff. And we don't know how much news cameras can uh, pick up what they're doing right this particular moment. We know the helicopter saw him raise his arm, but we don't know what's going on after that. Um, so we're not sure how well he could just speak to the cameras and discredit Endeavor, but that would be part of what the League of Villains' entire mission is. Their mission is to discredit the heroes, to make the public's faith waver in them. And discrediting Endeavor, the number one hero, would do that. Because then the actual society out there would have to decide, do we forgive him? And it could be an interesting story if his family ends up forgiving him, but society doesn't. But what could be even better, in my opinion, and I haven't heard people talking about this, is what if Dobby doesn't discredit Endeavor, doesn't reveal his past to all the world, he doesn't kill him, but he just tells him, I'm your son, and I became a villain because you were a shitty father. That way, even if society, whether, even if he reveals it, he can still do this. That way, whether society doesn't know or forgives him, whether his family forgives him, even if they all forgive him and are hailing Endeavor as the number one hero, 
Endeavor will still have this shadow. He'll be, it'll be the ultimate tragedy for him because even after making this road to redemption, it's still never going to be enough because he caused his son to become a villain. And he's going to have to live knowing that he caused his son to become a villain. And that would basically be his eternal punishment for what he did. And it wouldn't have to do with Shoto, but with Dobby. Which could be incredible if they go for this inescapable past storyline. Um, and some other things to talk about with Dobby here. Uh, I've never really truly understood what the scars he has are. Are they scars? Are they like leather he wears on himself? Or one theory that I brought up... And I said it was my theory, but then I kind of disproved my own theory. Um, I don't remember what evidence I used to disprove it, though. Uh, but I always talked about it to my friend. I was like, what if his, his skin is the burnt leathery looking stuff, and the actual, like, smooth human skin is just a mask and gloves that he wears? And I guess that would mean he has to wear a chest piece, too, because we see uh, skin, like, under the collar there. Um, so I'm like, what is the skin? and what is whatever he's wearing. So, wh what is the real Dobby, and what is something he's put on? Or are they both something he's put on? Because I saw somebody bring this up in the comments that I thought was really interesting, too, is they were like, what if he... Well, this goes kind of into his motivations for being a villain and what he's done. What if he was the one that Endeavor was trying to train first, but then Todoroki... or Shoto came along with a better quirk and he just sort of dumped Dobby to train Shoto and that is what caused Dobby to become a villain or what if he just always wanted to be like Endeavor but Endeavor didn't care about him he cared about Shoto that could be true as well um but something that somebody brought up that could lead into that is like what if he was trying to emulate Endeavor and that's how he got those burns because his burns happen to be on his forearms his like lower face and neck and below his eyes and people have brought up that's where Endeavor's mask of flames his beard of flames and the flames around his forearms are so what if he was just trying to be like Endeavor and he ended up burning himself trying to be like Endeavor um, that could be kind of cool or it could just be a sort of similar thing where it doesn't have anything to do with the past but it's just a design choice to show him being somewhat similar to Endeavor in that way or to hint at them being related uh, so that's kind of cool and again with him liking Endeavor and Shoto being the one that get, got trained his quirk may have something to do with that something that I thought about their quirks to myself and this has to go with the entire Todoroki family and with the colors of their hair and different things. So we know that Shoto's hair split straight down the middle, he has flames, and he has ice in equal part. And the reason that Endeavor made his kids the way he did was to cover for his weakness. He has firepower, but he needed to cool himself down. That was the entire point. Well, Fuyumi has mostly white hair with a little bit of red, so maybe her ability is that she has the strong ice power similar to what Shoto has, um, except she hasn't trained like Shoto, so they wouldn't be as strong as him, obviously. But what if she has mainly strong ice powers, but the ability to heat up her body so that she has that sort of uh, weakness covered? And then for Natsuo, his name is Natsu like Summer, but he has completely white hair, so you would think he just has ice powers, or maybe his quirk is just weak, we don't know what's up with Natsu, but this got me thinking that if we go in age order and assume that Dobby is between Natsu and Shoto, then we've got the first one coming up has ice powers but can warm herself, then we have whatever Natsu is. What if Dobby is the opposite of um, Fuyumi, essentially? Because we know that in those flashbacks he had white hair, and I guess he just dyed it black or whatever. Um, but we know he had white hair, which would lead you to think he would have some of Ray's powers, but we've seen his quirk is that he has flames, and they're hot flames, because, uh, because Twice called them cold while he called the ice hot. So we can assume he wasn't lying, that he just calls them the opposite of what they are, so they are actually hot flames, uh, even though they're blue. So maybe he had Endeavor's super powerful flames, and even though he had Endeavor's super powerful flames, he had the ability to cool himself off. He had the cure for Endeavor's weakness. Maybe Endeavor thought, okay, 
I've found it. I have found my golden egg, the person to surpass all might, because they have my power, but without my weakness. And so he started training Dobby. And then Sho and then Shoto hits the age where his quirk manifests, and they find out that, oh, he not only has my power and the cure to and the cure to the weakness, but he has ice as well and the cure to the weakness. So he has both and the cure to each is weakness, he's even better than what I originally planned. So what if Dobby was Endeavor's original plan? He was exactly what Endeavor wanted. And maybe that's going to go into Dobby and why I became a villain. He's going to be like, I was exactly what you wanted. I, I was the reason you did all this. And then Shoto came along and was better, and you picked him instead. So that could be a really good backstory for Dobby. Uh, and again, would lead into him and Shoto being sort of endgame rivals for one another. So yeah, all of that. And I, it makes me think I kind of want endgame rivals to be more of a thing for other side characters too. Um, even though Shoto is kind of an important side character. Uh, but yeah, so I guess that's it for my discussion of 190, my review of 190. There was a lot to talk about here. Well, it's like 40 minutes, I think. Um, so yeah. You can tell I really love this series, and I really love this arc. This is probably... Yeah, this beats the Stain arc, which was my previous favorite arc. This is probably my new favorite arc. Uh, and this... This is one of my favorite chapters. I don't want to say it's exactly my favorite, because some of the chapters during... Um, during Izuku against Bakugo I really love, and some of the chapters with... Well, I guess the chapter with Stain's speech I love... But the chapter I'm thinking of is one of the ones around the middle of the All all Might and All for One fight, where we have the Nana flashbacks. That's one of my favorite chapters. I think it's like 90... It's not 92. It's not that far along. Or is it? It's somewhere around that area, though. Uh, the early 90s, late 80s, I think. Uh, but yeah, that... Yeah, I guess it is around 92. Somewhere around there is my favorite chapter. Um, so yeah, I guess that's it for this review. As long as it is, if you could even call it a review anymore. Is there anything I wanted to say about any of them? Nah, I guess I covered most of it. And if I forgot, we can talk about it in the comments and we can talk about it in the hot Q&A. So, oh well. Uh, sorry, this is a Franken video, a half and half one. This is a Shoto video. Um, sorry about that, but like if you did like the video, comment down there too. Tell me what you thought of this chapter, all these subjects and my thoughts on them, I guess. Um, then follow on. I'm just now, I'm just now recalling some things that I had planned to talk about but didn't, but they aren't really pertinent to the subject at hand, so I guess I won't. Um, but, um, either way, uh, subscribe for more Boku no Hero Academia, both anime and manga. Um, follow on Twitter if you want. I can try to keep you updated there and stuff for the channel. Or if you want to talk to me or more of us on Discord, I can uh, give you a link to that. Everyone's free. Welcome to join. So, uh, yeah. I guess, um, like, comment, subscribe, and all that is what I just said. So, yeah, that's it. Thank you once again for watching, and I'll see you all next time.